everybody. Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Special guest in the building, it's Martha Cooper. How are you? Hi, DJ. Thanks for having me. Very nice to meet you. First of all, congratulations on the documentary. Perfectly called Martha. Yeah. All about you, your <laughs> life, your career. How crazy is it? Are you all, have you processed all this, that someone has made a film about your life and your work? Uh, no, I haven't really processed <laughs> it. I'm in the processing process. There you go. Is that a constant thing? Just an evolution yes. over time? Yes. Well, tonight I'm going to see it again. How many times have you seen it? Once. What did you think? I liked it. I liked it, but I think I missed some of the subtleties. Mm. Yeah, once so you go good. back a second time, yeah, you now catch I want to more really things. watch it. Definitely. And I mean, from what I've read and the little part I've seen so far, you have a really fascinating story. So let's start at the beginning. Take me back to when you first get your hands on a camera and when you first fall in love with all this. Well, I first got my hands on the camera because my father had a camera store and gave me a camera when I was in nursery school. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, you were so, really young. Um, and always used to take me on what he called camera runs, which basically was going around the city looking for pictures. And that's sort of what I do now. So I started when I was like three. Wow. So what part and of the city was it back uh, then? Baltimore. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Not, not the same city. Right. We're in New York City. <laughs> that was Baltimore. And, um, I, you know, I toyed with various career options, but really I just wanted to be a photographer. What else were you considering? Anthropology. I but think then it turned out choice. it was too analytical for me. <laughs> so I did the next best thing. I married an anthropologist. Oh, there you go. So yeah. I had that in your life. <laughs> that didn't last. But, <laughs> but I, it was just too hard to I be gotcha. an anthropologist. You had to get a PhD. Hmm. Too analytical. I mean, I, my idea was that I was going to go take pictures of tribes. Because <laughs> hmm. uh, you've been all around the world taking I pictures. I have been all around the world. Give yeah. me some of the craziest spots you've been in your time. Well, let's, I'll just start with one spot, which is, it's not such a crazy spot, but for graffiti, mm -hmm. it's a crazy spot, and that's Tahiti, hmm. because that's where I met Selena. Oh, wow. And that's where the germ of this documentary started, but you wouldn't think that Tahiti would be a place where anybody would want graffiti, but no. in fact, there was a graffiti festival wow. uh, for four or five years. I went four of the five years, and um, even the Tourist Bureau was supporting it. Wow, so really would you imagine that yeah. people would go to Tahiti to see graffiti? That's crazy. No, I would no, never in my never. wildest dreams imagine that. <laughs> and, and when I was photographing graffiti in New York City, I never imagined it would go any further than New York. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> yeah, because in New York at that time, it's just this underground world, and it's not like it's being pumped up by people. You're trying to take no, down people that are doing exactly. graffiti. Exactly, and it seemed as if it was a product of the times. Mm. Uh, New York was going bankrupt, and there were vast areas with vacant lots, and there were holes in the fences of subway yards, and there were just many things that allowed graffiti to happen in New York. And I thought, well, this is never going to, no, no other country is going to be able to hmm. put this together in the same way. But I was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, There's when you first see graffiti at that time, it, it's visually appealing. It, it stands out to you. But what fascinated you the most about this whole underworld that was starting to become mainstream? Well, it wasn't all that visually appealing, actually. No? No. In fact, it, you know, it was, it was indecipherable. Hmm. And what made it appealing to me was meeting a young boy who explained to me that he was writing his name. And then after I understood the kids were writing their nicknames and that it wasn't just random vandalism, it was precisely <laughs> time vandalism. You know, yeah, it's, it's an art. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that they were writing their names and writing them again and again and again. And it was a matter of getting up mm. and how many times they could do that and where they could do that. Um, I just became fascinated with it because they knew what was going on, but pretty much nobody else did. <laughs> So when did other people start to catch on? Well, a lot of them still haven't caught on. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that is? Um, because I think that they equate, even, I think the term graffiti has a negative connotation. And when you even say it, they immediately go vandalism. Mm. And they're not thinking, well, you know, vandalism could also be art. Um, and I'm, I'm not the f arguing, oh, this is all fine art or sure. anything like that. But. Um, you know, people don't like to see spray-painted names where they're not supposed to be. Yeah. You know, they're mm. like... They shouldn't it's, it's be here. Yeah. Yes, they shouldn't be here. But 
On the other hand, mostly people do not complain about advertising, which in, you know, in New York City, it's just everywhere. everywhere. I yeah. mean, think about the subway now. The, it's on the trains even. It's on the turnstiles. It's every it's single place. It's on the posts. Yeah. There's you know, su whole those subway trains. Vinyl wraps. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And I think, where do you think they got that idea of moving? It's buses have mm -hmm. ads on them. Nobody complains about that. Yeah, we're perfectly fine with that. Yes, perfectly fine. Yeah, it's really interesting. And some of the ads are really ugly. Yeah, and yeah. just too much, you know? And, and, and also indecipherable. That too. I yeah. mean, last night we were passing an ad and we're like, what is that advertising? <laughs> and you're going past a bus shelter and, w y you know, it, surely an advertising agency spent time designing this ad. But if you can't read it and tell what it is going by the bus station, why does that make it any better or different from a tag that you can't read? Sure, yeah. And at least you know the tag was done by hand. <laughs> right, that's true. So when you started showing some of these pictures to your colleagues at the Post, friends, family, etc. Nobody was interested. Not, not a single person. Oh, no, I won't say that. There were a few people that were sort of interested, but not the Post, definitely, no, mm. not interested. Um, my ex-husband, somewhat interested, because okay. he was an anthropologist. Right. So he, so he kind of got, 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 got it. But his colleagues really argued it. they did not get it. Wow. They hated it. So when did people start to get it, or at least start to see what you were capturing here? Um, well, you know, we had a lot of, Henry Chalfant and I met through graffiti writers. We both were documenting trains, and we decided to do a book, and nobody would publish it. And we could not, we must have had, I don't know, 25, 30 rejections. Wow. We tried every publishing company we could think of, and we had to go to Europe to get it published. So I would say in New York, you know, when did they start getting it? I don't know, you know, did they get it? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, can honestly ask that question. Got it. It, the next generation's got it. Right, but at that time, it's just graffiti is labeled a certain way, you throw vandalism in there, yeah. and that's the way that people are gonna think about it. You know, it's almost marijuana in a very similar way, labeled a certain way, exactly. and you can't get out from underneath that. Yeah. So for mm -hmm. you that's been there on the ground seeing this, I'm sure you chuckle to yourself sometimes because it can be an organic experience for somebody. They're putting their name, they're putting a story behind it, and some people are just never gonna get that. But of course then it made me feel like, well, I get it. <laughs> it gave me an inside track You're on what You're in this little exclusive club. And yes, then well, then that, that was part of the attraction. Totally. Was that, um, exact, exclusive is a word that journalists often use, mm -hmm. that you know, they want an exclusive, so I felt that I had an exclusive on this subject matter, and that made it more appealing. Definitely, and even though you struggled to get your book published, once it does get published, people start looking at this, and it's people all around the world that are touched by it, so how cool was well, that for you? It did, the book did not do well, especially the first edition, and it definitely didn't do well in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, which was considered a foreign edition by the, the, it was an English publisher. It started to do well in Europe, but it wasn't for about 20 years until I understood that. Wow, and why uh, do you think it took so long? It, it just really, t because I had kind of backed away from the topic. Mm -hmm. I was doing other things, and par partially it was because I wasn't paying attention. And it wasn't until I did another book and I traveled in Europe that I understood the impact. Mm. Because then we did a book signing tour across Europe for another book I did called The Hip Hop Files, old hip hop pictures, and lots of ki graffiti kids writers I'm sure they turned like that out book. for that book, yeah. yeah, and they, you know, when they came up to me and then they told, oh, Subway Art, and they brought copies of their book, all of the covers fell off of almost every, wow. every book, and they, but they had them all pieced back together, and um, that's when I began to understand that it had, had, it had spread further than I ever thought it could have. Yeah, there's some mass appeal here, which is really yeah. cool. <laughs> so, when you meet Selena in Tahiti, yeah. what's the yeah. initial pitch in terms of the documentary? Um, well, Can we talk to Selena? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I. It wasn't as if we just dis really discussed it then. Certainly not the first time we met. But I got to see Selena in action, and Selena is an expert with a drone. Mm. And I think maybe that might have been the first time I'd really seen a drone in serious professional use. And she would carry that thing around and send that thing up and oh, game bring changers. that thing down. Yeah. And, 
And I was really impressed with that, mm. with her technical skills with the drone. And then people told me about these videos that she had, and I saw them, and she's got this one amazing video called Limitless, which I recommend you look at I'll if you check haven't it seen it. Yeah. And it's, I think it's gotten something like 12 million views oh, on wow. YouTube. I don't think it had that many then, but <laughs> maybe it had <laughs> six to pop million a little or something. Bit. But that w it's a hilarious, uh, funny, well done video, and so I was impressed with that. And so after, and we drove around Tahiti because she was filming the same thing I was. I was shooting still, she was shooting video. Mm -hmm. um, we both needed to take pictures of people painting walls. And I mean, they, they brought people over to paint walls. It wasn't, wow. this was not illegal, this was legal. This is encouraged. Yeah, and, and the, first, the first year I was there, it was a real graffiti festival, like letter-based graffiti, not street art, which mm. I consider something a little bit different. What are the differences? Well, graffiti is about letters. It's mm. about writing your name with style. That's the basis of graffiti writing. Graffiti as we're talking about it, New York City style. Right. Street art can be, and it's usually spray paint or marker. It can be a tag or it can be a piece. It can be like 3D pieces, but still it's spray paint and marker. Street art can be anything. It can be yarn. It can be tiles. It can, be any, it, it can be any kind of material, and it can be any kind of imagery. And it usually isn't letter-based. It's not alphabet, you know? I mean, even graffiti in foreign countries, can, you can have Cyrillic lettering. Mm. Um, or, you know, in Israel, you can have Hebrew. It doesn't have to be, what, what do you call an American alphabet? Uh, not a Roman alphabet? What, what's our alphabet? I don't know. It doesn't, yeah, have, to be it doesn't have to be A, B, C. Right. Like we know it. Yeah. It can be it's any much kind more of. It's open-ended. Yeah, in yeah. other countries, but it's still letters. Hmm. And that, to me, that is, when I say graffiti, that's what I'm talking about. I gotcha. And it's mostly names. I gotcha. Nicknames. And street art is, which is mostly what uh, the festivals that mm -hmm. we go to, it's mostly uh, street artists painting big murals. It's more like muralism. Hmm. So whereas graffiti might have a little character thrown in, or sometimes a character is like introducing the piece, <laughs> uh, street art often is like no letters at all, mm. just a big um, a mural. I gotcha. So as the documentary is starting to be made, what was most interesting for you in terms of unpacking your life and your career and just the impact of all your work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what was the most interesting? Well, it, it did require me to dig up a lot of old stuff. And I, I don't throw a lot of things away. You so like to keep I do it? I do have I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm a hoarder, but I do have a lot of boxes full of papers and books and things and Selena was very energetic when you said the word unpacking. Selena uh, literally <laughs> unpacked. Literally and figuratively yes, unpacked. Yes, I mean I have four storage rooms. Wow. Three in my um my building and one in Manhattan mini storage in Harlem, and Selena went to all of them, and <laughs> you know we rooted around <laughs> looking, for, and we and we came up with some interesting things. So that was, I mean, that was like a that trip, must been cool. a yeah. trip through memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of boxes. It was a, it is a lot of boxes, and it's still a lot of boxes. But I mean, think about how many pictures you've taken over the years. Oh, I'm sure millions. Millions. And I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. No. Definitely and mo mostly film mm. and slides. Wow, yeah. You know, transparent. You know what a slide is? I do know what a slide you know, is. But, yeah. but I didn't personally we, use we, a slide, we, but <laughs> I do know what a slide is. I think there are people now that wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, if I said no, slides, honestly. wouldn't know. Uh, they're <laughs> transparencies. Do they're you, in slide pages. They're in big files. Do you, you know? miss anything about those old days and the older technology? No. Like the digitized world that we live in? I like digital. I, I prefer digital. It's nice and easy, right? It is. You mm -hmm. Instagram on the way here, boom, it's but out there. But also, people can I mean, it. in terms of getting a picture, like with film, remember, first of all, only 36 frames mm, on a roll right. of film. Yeah. I mean, I used to, when I traveled, I would have to travel. What if you run out of film and you're in a country that they don't right. sell film? You, you can't run out of film in that situation. Yeah, so you have to take a lot of film. Mm. And there was always the x ray problem where you're not supposed to put it through x rays you know, in the scanner when you're going into the airport, so you have to wrap it up. And I mean, you're carrying most of your luggage is film. 
and then you don't get to see it till you get home. Right. And, you and no if you've idea. made a mistake, if you set your ISO incorrectly, or you know, and there's so many things that can happen with film, and you don't know until you get home. There's no way to recoup that shot. Whereas here, you can continually right, check. Right. You have your computer, your phone. Yeah, you, you can, can check how it's going. Yeah, you can see, and that that's plus digital balances the light for you. True. So film, you know, we're shooting daylight yeah. film, so you either filter it or whatever, and it was very slow, hmm. 64 ISO. Yeah, it's really transformed. Really so slow, yeah. right? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, so there's a, like a lot of advantages with digital. Hmm. So when people check out the documentary, start to learn about their sto your story, what do you want people to think about everything when it comes to your story? Um, well, one about my work, I want them to see the breadth of my work and not just see me as a graffiti and street art photographer, even though that is, if, if I hadn't done that, we wouldn't be doing the sure. documentary. But there's, there, much there's the a story. lot more, and Celine included it, and I'm really happy about that. And two, I'm, for f like young photographers, I think they, they can see that persistence goes a long way. And if you have a career goal and you really want that goal and you have to keep trying and trying and trying because um, there were many rejections along the way and, and mistakes and some goals as I wanted to work for National Geographic. I finally got to work for mm. National Geographic and then it turned out I wasn't any good mm. at working for National It wasn't really my thing once I got to where I thought I wanted to go. So, you, you know, there are twists and turns in a career path and I think that young, not just photographers, but maybe people in the arts or maybe anybody on any kind of career seeing that movie might um, just be inspired to keep at it. Yeah, definitely. I think that's great advice because we always think about the end goal in our culture and some people mm -hmm. don't get there, some people do get there and it's not what they expected or it's different yeah. and, and so you it's have time to for feel else. free to change that goal. Right. Maybe. Adjust. Yeah. yeah, exactly. To adapt and adjust and switch to another path. Mm -hmm. and and um, and maybe understand better about what you're good at, and then go down that road, and all of that happens. So we're talking, you know, I've been at it now for over 50 years. Yeah, decades. So takes decades, time. Decades. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think that's a good lesson to learn, and I hope I communicated that, and I think I did. Absolutely. Yeah, and and so I think, I think Selena was able to communicate that. I think it's about out. me. I think so. it's worked out pretty well for you. That is Martha Cooper. Martha, a picture story is the name of the film. Instagram, the website. Martha, your personal Instagram as well. At Martha Cooper Graham. There you go. Yes. That's Martha. I'm DJ. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.